choose, I want you all to myself. There's plenty of room, I want all that I can get. And I don't want to choose, I want you all to consent. There's enough love for all of us to share and you. Hello and welcome. My name is Melissa Rebronia. I am a trauma-sensitive healing practitioner and host at HealYourHeart.Love. And today's guest is Jessica Fern. Jessica Fern is a psychotherapist, coach, and certified clinical trauma professional. She is the author of Polysecure, the Polysecure Workbook, The Hearts of Being Polysecure, and Polywise, all amazing books I highly recommend. In her international private practice, Jessica works with individuals, couples, and people in multiple partner relationships who no longer want to be limited by their reactive patterns, cultural conditioning, insecure attachment styles, and past traumas, helping them to embody new possibilities in life and love. For more information on Jessica Fern and her work, go to jessicafern.com. So welcome, Jessica. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to be with you. And first of all, thank you for being who you are and thank you for the work that you do. I think mm -hmm. it's amazing. And I have most of your books. <laughs> this, amazing. This, extra amazing. <laughs> and then this one here. Oh, you've got them all? There's something that's hearts of being poly secure. It's a that... poster. It's just a poster. Yeah. Okay, beautiful. I think that... Anybody, I mean, in relationships should read these books, mm -hmm. couples, therapists, relationship therapists, people working with people literally should read your books. And I wish that this existed like 15 years ago or, years ago, right? <laughs> or when I was 11, because that was actually my first experience of having to deal with multiple love relationships at 11. Yes. Believe it yeah. or not at 11 years yeah. old. Tell us how you got into this work. I got into it through my clients. I was working as a psychotherapist in Boulder. And in the same week, all my couples came to me exploring opening up. And I didn't know what to do. <laughs> you know, professionally, there wasn't any training in it at all. As far as I knew then, I didn't find anything when I looked for it. So I just quickly got the books they said they were reading. And I had personal experience with non-monogamy, but that's different than knowing how to support people and professionally. Mm -hmm. So what got me into it is just like, oh, I need to help these people and fast. <laughs> yeah. So the only book that I knew of, which I think I read back in the day, in the early 2000s was The Ethical Slut. Mm -hmm. I saw that you listed a bunch of other books that I never heard of and so glad that you are sharing that as resources. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about The Ethical Slut, like even the title is so judgmental. Yeah, right. It can It's taboo, right? Yeah. To bring the word slut in, which is great. I mean, that's yeah. part of- It's like yeah. unshaming the word yeah. slut. I, I would love for people, as I know that you primarily work yeah. people that are non-monogamous, However, I found that your work is so, so helpful and needed for even the monogamous culture. And I found that your books are welcoming to that because there's always like whether you're monogamous or non-monogamous and the journey of shifting your paradigm could, could also end up that you decide that you're actually monogamous which is exactly. beautiful. Yeah, I love that. Right, right. <laughs> exactly. I work with both monogamous and non-monogamous clients, or even sometimes within a couple, it's a monogamous and non-monogamous partner. So I'm in favor of both, even though obviously I'm one of the voices of non-monogamy as an advocate. And a lot of the healing part of reading your books, attending your lecture, the class is naming and defining things. It's so interesting finding where we fit who we are. Why don't we start with what is the definition of monogamy? Mm -hmm. Oh, Let's of say. monogamy? Yeah. I think it would traditionally be romance and sex with one partner. Exclusivity, romantic, emotional, and sexual exclusivity. Right. Yeah. So that is the, the normative, right? That's the normative. And then we have consensual 
non-monogamy is also a structure. Yes. So what is the simple definition of that? That's the umbrella term for having more than one lover, whether that's romantic or sexual, and everyone knows everyone's consenting. Beautiful. There's no secrecy. It's not cheating. I love that. So yeah. that is so powerful, so brave, and so courageous, because as we know, so many people are actually practicing non-consensual non-monogamy, also known as cheating. Like exactly. so many. So many people. Statistically, yeah. it's it's really bad. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. How many people admit to, to cheating, and that's just who admit to it. There's more people, I think, who are explicitly non-monogamous and then espousing monogamy but actually non-monogamous absolutely yes yeah. absolutely so I'm in secrecy and shame judging consensual non-monogamy are there other relationship structures or your umbrella covers all the other ones consensual non-monogamy covers a lot which we can get into some more of those details i think relationship anarchy sort of leaves <laughs> You know, where people are not doing this prioritization of relationship based on sort of sex and romance mm -hmm. and have are embracing more of a relationship fluidity, sort of breaking out of certain labels and hierarchy. Could you give us a little summary of the relationship structures that exist within consensual non-monogamy? Yeah, we could see those as the different styles of non-monogamy. So it could be monogamish where we have a couple that is mostly exclusive and then occasionally maybe they bring in a third or on a business trip, there's a hookup or something like that. Mm -hmm. There's open relationship or open marriage, which again is usually this primary couple that might have some, some casual experiences on the side or occasional. Um, there's swingers, which again, I'm sort of going from like the primacy of the couple and then we'll shift to the other end of it. Swingers is usually a couple that's been going to have sexual experiences with a third or another couple. And they're usually trying to maintain that primacy of their emotional connection, mm -hmm. emotional relationship, even yeah. though they're sexually non-monogamous. Mm -hmm. um, then we start to shift into people who are more identifying as polyamorous where there's multiple loves, multiple in love relationships, multiple attachment relationships that can have hierarchy, but then there's many people who like to practice non-hierarchical polyamory, mm -hmm. which says my heart does not you know, rate people as higher or less or more. Resources might be divvied out differently. Time might not always be equal, but there's sort of this really deconstructing of hierarchy and love. Mm -hmm. There's solo polyamory, which is someone who is usually embracing themselves as their primary relationship and mm -hmm. usually not looking to cohabitate or entwine like financially with other people. Mm -hmm. And yet they might have many long-term deeply connected relationships. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. And there's platonic life partners or poly intimates, which might not have a sexual component to the relationship, but saying we're friends doesn't cut it. I love that term. Yeah. Because I am still friends with most of my exes. Right. And I've always been like that because yeah. I considered people that I've been in relationship almost like family. So when I heard that term, it feels like my exes fit in that term. Yeah. Right. And yeah. I would assume when you have a new partner, you have to kind of talk about that person differently than a quote unquote friend. Yes. A part of me always wanted to make sure that my new partner is comfortable with the friendships that I have with my exes. Right. So in your teaching in your, and in your book, you actually have an axis where it's like high sexual exclusivity to low sexual exclusivity and then emotional exclusivity versus high, right? Yes. Right. And so everything we've named sort of would go on different points of this axis. Yeah. And in my head, I always thought that if you are poly, that automatically means you're having sex with other people. Not necessarily, right? Poly means multiple loves. So you yes. can identify as being asexual and polyamorous. Or sometimes those relationships ebb and flow and how sex is experienced and expressed. Yeah. So there's also polyfidelity. I should add that sometimes when there's multiple people that are closed with each other, like a triad or a quad. There's more than one person, but then they're not necessarily dating others. They're yes, so there's that, exclusivity I love with the three or four. <laughs> yes, I love that. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, so that's in this book. Like 
get it, buy it. According to your chart, I think I started my life as being poly mono. How so for you? Just, I used to say mono poly, but then I realized it, it's like you, you say it from which point of view. Right. So I started my life being comfortable with having multiple loves. So in fact, even when I was 11, we were on a school excursion. There was interest in me. And I remember, and then a guy asked me out and the other guy that liked me, who I also liked was very sad. So I'm like, oh, I broke his heart. But basically it was decided for me that I was now the person who asked me out his girlfriend. Right. But I remember having this moment. Well, I don't necessarily think that I can't be with you, but the other guy was hurt and he went away. He was already a <laughs> Later when I was a little older, like a teen, like 17, 18, and I had that same boyfriend that was platonic since 11. It's funny. I wanted to explore. So I, I actually asked him, can I kiss so-and-so? And he goes, well, why do you want to do that? And I said, I just want to explore. I want to have like more than one experience. And he said, okay, but just make sure nobody sees you. Huh. Right? So then I went, I had the kiss. And then that guy thought that we were now in a relationship. And I was like, no, I'm still with my boyfriend. So then I saw that our society is kind of like, it's confusing. Like I couldn't be poly mono. Yeah. So then I just became monogamous. Yes. And then later in life, I found that why I say that I am poly mono is because I was never attracted to men who wanted to have multiple people. I found myself comfortable, but I always dated safe guys that would provide, you know, I would be the one and only. Now, yes. reading this book <laughs> and I'm going through it still, it could be that I have, it's a princess part. Yes. So, and I think that a lot of men, are especially people that are practicing non-consensual non-monogamy mm -hmm. are possibly poly mono yes i think a lot of people who find themselves cheating or are cheating yeah <laughs> many of them are more non-monogamous yeah polyamorous even by orientation they're yes. trying to be monogamous and it's not working for them right so complex and i appreciate this complexity Often our sexual orientation and our relationship orientation, it's not static. I want to reduce it to a phase either, yes. right? But I think in our own personal evolution, we do go through different iterations of ourselves and certain structures or orientations work better for those times or make the most sense. I love that in one of your books, you mentioned that when you looked back at your adolescence, you were basically practicing a form of non-monogamy, but I think all of us can say that. Yeah, I did. I mean, probably, yeah, at 14, it was more official that it was mm -hmm. happening, but I look back and I'm like, even in these like 12, 13 year old initial, right. there was all these love triangles. <laughs> right. That's what I mean. So yeah, that's it's why so it's important to, yeah. to normalize that. I think most of us are poly in some sense, if we're being real. Yeah, I think, you know, if we give ourselves permission, if you could, yes. what do you think? Yes. Yeah. Is being CNM an orientation or a lifestyle choice? This is a common question. I think it's still, it can be a contentious question. And my answer is both. Mm -hmm. um, because it's what I see. I mean, I'm working very intimately with clients all day. Right. right. And I have clients who are absolutely, this is their orientation. This is how they're wired, how they're most healthy in themselves, how they're happiest in the world. It's who they are. And then there's other clients who they're doing it, but they wouldn't have done this on their own. Mm -hmm. And it's a lifestyle that they're choosing and they would give it up maybe if their partner wasn't. Right. Yes. Interesting. You know, and they're putting in a lot of effort to get to the place where they're at ease with this as the lifestyle that they're in or that right. they're choosing. Yeah. And they would not define it as an orientation. They actually don't like it being defined that way. And then people who feel orientation don't want it to be called a lifestyle. Right. Yeah. And I think a lot of it has to come down to what do we allow is legitimate. So I mm -hmm. think societally, culturally, if something's not a choice, like the color of your skin, or usually, you know, your sexual orientation, then we feel like it has more legitimacy. I didn't choose it. So I should have rights. Mm, yes. And yet 
I mean, religion is a choice. We can be born into religion, but we also can choose a religion and then we have, we're a protected class. So I think I want us to allow, like, we can choose something and still have, be valid, have legal rights that we should be granted. Thank you for that. And have you found that it's more men than women that are- I don't find more men than women, but against what people would think I find women in- a male female relationship are the ones initiating it more than men that's what i heard which is really mm -hmm. interesting and fascinating to me yeah so you would think that it's the opposite right we think it's the opposite i think often men have been allowed to have extramarital relationships it, it's right. sort of an unspoken expectation or we say that men and their sex drive is natural right and yes we don't allow that to women in the same way and yet most commonly or more so than not women are the one initiating it in a male female dynamic then we have you know same sex relationships queer relationships that yeah this is very common there is that polarity and there's all these books about you know it's just biology men you yeah. know I mean what do you think about that that for women biologically if they do sleep with somebody they get more attached than a man would I don't necessarily think so. I mean, I think if we get into the biology, we can probably make cases for either. Right. End. Okay. But I think all humans produce oxytocin with touch and skin to skin and orgasm. And that's a powerful factor. You know? And I think there can be a drive in women too, that once they mate with one male, they actually want to mate with someone else after and mm -hmm. to mix up the genetic pool. So there's actually yes. a lot of like, evolutionary biological explanations that would say that women don't want to be monogamous mm -hmm. that yeah, makes and sense. sex at dawn some people I really appreciated sex at dawn of just explaining female sexuality in this much broader way mm, I love that I have that on my list from your book so thank you for recommending yeah it's a good one I think patriarchal conditioning and religious conditioning obviously has a huge effect on how we view women's sexuality have you done research and well maybe some of these books have it's like pre-patriarchal religions what people live like exactly sex at dawn shares some of those sort of pre-patriarchy and also current you know indigenous communities and how they practice and how they don't necessarily have monogamy or how they even frame conception itself that a woman will pick several men within the community that she wants to sleep with so that they're all infusing the baby with those qualities of the different men. Amazing. Awesome. I love that. I think we need more of that. We need that to be part yeah, of education. Need, right. The stories of just how people have done it differently and people are doing it differently and the reason why monogamy came about. I mean, I'm not a historian, but the history of monogamy is really fascinating to get into and it can be disturbing too because it's like oh it was really to control female yeah return uh yeah let's talk about normalizing jealousy yes you have a mini workshop that people can purchase and i did that the title was what what's your jealousy trying to tell you yes and i really really enjoyed that because i think that is a huge issue in relationships in general and people actually, like you mentioned in the presentation, get killed because of jealousy. Yes. Your books would, would be a huge part of healing that. Mm -hmm. Just going through the deconditioning. And there's so many unhealthy, toxic relationships, monogamous or non-monogamous, where jealousy is a big thing. Exactly. And jealousy has also done a lot of internal damage where people think that there's something wrong with them. Yeah, right. the comparison. It's so yes. painful. Yeah. A friend who recently said that 15 years ago, when I was telling her that I was interviewing you, she was like, 15 years ago, I dated somebody who was poly and I wanted to be in relationship with them. But then she found herself really, really hurt. And then she thought that something was wrong with her. She mm. went online to look, but she couldn't find anything. So yeah. she wishes that these books existed where she can actually heal and look at what part is that? Yes, usually jealousy is more than one part. Yeah. And there might be the jealous part, and then that's protecting even hurt parts that predate the experience we're even having. 
or are completely about the experience that we're having. Yeah. And then you invented the term justice jealousy. Do you yeah, want to share idea, what that yeah. is? Yeah. Yeah. So that was a an experience of jealousy I came across that wasn't just about my own insecurities or comparing myself. It really had to do with the relationship. And it's this experience where in partnership, usually long-term relationships, we've been asking for something for a while and our partner just doesn't do it. It's not their love language. It's kind of not how they are. And we come to this, it's this whole process of like, okay, I'm just going to accept that I'm not getting this or it's not who they are. And then one day they're with someone else and they're giving that exact thing you've wanted to someone else. And it's infuriating. It's so painful. It's this mm -hmm. injustice, right? Mm -hmm. The je jealousy. And it's not actually possessive jealousy. Mm -hmm. It's exposing relational neglect mm -hmm. is usually what's happening. Mm -hmm. That often that person was sort of not registering what their partner needed or not taking it seriously or taking them for granted or thinking they could coast. Yes. <laughs> and then often in new connections, we have to step Put our best foot forward and we mm -hmm. wind up doing things that previous partners are like where did that come from love that so hopefully you're going to be doing some future work on jealousy like yeah i mean i like the little workshop i put out is sort of my contribution because there's other good resources too um but i think seeing it from that me we or society framework of what's mm -hmm. the root of your jealousy and then working with it as a part are and my favorite ways it can literally be applied to any relationship within yeah, family dynamics. Not, exactly. Coworkers. Pets, even with yes. pets. Yeah. <laughs> so funny. My house has jealousy around pets. No, it's very, it's very interesting because like I wanted to talk to you about redefining the word compersion. Yeah. So for those who don't know, a lot of people don't know, what is the definition of compersion? So compersion is happiness for your partner's happiness with someone else that they are having a positive pleasurable experience and you feel that sense of your own pleasure because of it and some people say that it's the opposite of jealousy mm -hmm. I think yes and no so okay it's maybe the opposite of jealousy but we can still have both at the same time the way that we can Why? say oh I'm bittersweet about that or I feel happy and sad so it's like one doesn't cancel out the other. Mm -hmm. I've had moments of feeling genuine compersion and that justice jealousy exactly at the same time. Right. I love that. Normalizing yeah. that you can, you know, hold more than one. Right. So even if people want to label it as opposite, it doesn't mean it's you experience one or the other. <laughs> right. Compersion doesn't only mean sexual compersion. For example, I jokingly tell my husband that I experience compersion when I see him with his dog because I came after and he would joke like she's always number one. I generally see them as a somewhat of soulmates. So mm -hmm. I, I, I loved her too, right? She passed away right. last year, but she was a special, special soul and they had a special, special connection. Would it be correct to say that that was compersion? I think it's sympathetic joy. This okay. is a Buddhist concept mm -hmm. and it's one of the four immeasurables. It's like one of the four types of enlightenment, the way enlightenment shines through us and sympathetic joy is one of those that really I'm happy for your happiness. So you're so happy, genuinely happy that your friend got a promotion or you see your husband with a dog and you feel that warmth inside of you where I think compersion is sort of, you know, a facet of this that's specifically is trying to refer to the uniqueness of feeling that when it is another romantic or sexual partner. Okay. Yeah. And it does feel different. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. I feel like there could be a whole book written just on that title to decondition, to get to compersion, if you can, because it, it feels a little intimidating. Yes. Or Marie Thuin is coming out with a book on compersion in the next few months. Oh, and I was fortunate to be able to write the forward for it. And she, it's more of an academic book. She has done her dissertation, her PhD dissertation on researching compersion. So people just look out for this. Okay. And what's her name again? Marie Thuin, T-H-O-U-I-N. Okay. okay that is cool. Right. Yay. Thank you. Yeah. I yeah, love it. So there is, there is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. Is 
secure love monogamous? Mm, I think it could be, but it doesn't have to be. Yeah. I think, I think this idea that, right, secure love is only monogamous, no way. Yeah. But it could be. It yeah. could be. Yeah. Could so be. the answer is for some people. For some people. Yeah. And I don't think it's, I need monogamy to feel secure. That wouldn't be the way to make that equation versus feeling secure in this relationship. And you might say that the monogamy is what's the best match for us. Yeah. Yeah. And you're one of the first people that brought in attachment theory with multiple relationships. Yeah. And I think it's amazing because again, it could be applied to not just romantic relationships. Like in the example of, there are some people that have jealousies towards, you know, their partner's dog, right. their, their partner's kids, if they're like step parents. Oh yeah, that's like it's, a big one. Yes. Yeah. So we get to look at our insecure attachment and multiple relationships. Let me ask you about the terminology, how you came about poly secure and then poly wise. What does that mean? Yeah. So my publisher and distributor helps with the name poly secure. And that was this play on, you know, secure attachment. So being secure, but this poly secure, being secure in poly. With multiple yeah. relationships. With multiple relationships. Exactly. Yeah. Having yeah. more than one security. Then poly wise was a play on poly secure. Right? Mm -hmm. It went yeah. all together as two companion pieces of work. Poly wise was a play on a few things too. It was a play on poly secure. Often a shorthand in sessions with people will be chatting, checking in at the beginning of a session and then they'll go, okay. And so poly wise, meaning, you know, in reference to poly stuff, and then also throughout the book, wanting to talk about shifting into more wisdom of how we do poly, a, yeah. a maturing process that happens as we go through all of the ups and downs of living polyamorously. And you wrote this with your ex-husband, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. And I love that you co-wrote the book and I also listened to the audio and it's, the audio, yeah. I love that it is actually your voice and his voice because a lot of people get somebody else to do it. It's really well done. So I'm halfway through and I'm going to continue. Thank you. Yes. It's so interesting that you're not the only one, but people want to refer to him as my ex-husband. Mm. And him and I have talked about that. It was actually one of his partners that was um, very generous to ask, how do you want me to introduce the two of you? We were at an event and she was introducing mm. people. And I was like, exes is really not fitting. I mean, because it sort of sent, we've been in each other's lives for over 20 years. We were married for 10, mm -hmm. but it's been five years since we decoupled from legal marriage, but we still live together. We co-parent together. We consider each other life partners. We're creative partners, right? Like there's such a richness and complexity to our relationship. We're not exes. Mm, I but it's that. interesting how that's like people want to send, there's a centering of marriage still. In I, I just did that. So you right, tell you me, yeah, it. I love yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. no. I appreciate it. So what would be the correct way to refer to We would to just it? say life partners. Even co-authors is a nice thing to co -authors, say. Co-authors, yes. Co-authors, yes. my co-parents, right? My nesting partner um, yes. or my life partner. Those all are fitting and appropriate terms that, yes, we did happen to be married for 10 years. <laughs> right. Such a good point. Absolutely. Yeah. Something in me was like, but he was your ex-husband and how Dude. wonderful yeah, And that sort of right ele yeah. is elevated and trumps everything else. And yet there is really something to see people that were married and are still in this relationship, yeah, that in relationship fluid, that is unique, right? It is noteworthy in some way, right? To yes. say, oh, ex, but it's interesting. That's like, we're not exes. <laughs> well, normalizing that you can still be in a re healthy relationship that's more than friends with somebody that you were either married to or in a long-term relationship or even short-term. I think our society needs more examples of that. It does. Yeah. And the Modern Family Institute, which is out of Berkeley, I'm working with them right now as they're sort of getting started in what I think is going to be some incredible work ahead mm -hmm. of them. 
but that is part of the mission to normalize these different ways of modern doing family in mm -hmm. the modern era. It's, it's becoming more common that people still continue to co-parent even though they're not in romantic partnership anymore. Mm -hmm. Your website is amazing, lists exactly how you work with people. And one of the ways is parts work. Mm -hmm. And I just love that you also created your own version of parts work specifically to this. And that's in this book. It's very yeah. powerful, but it starts with self. So creating yeah. secure attachment with self before you can even start. And that too, I think it can be, it needs to be a both and. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cause our attachment wounds came from relationships. And mm -hmm. so this idea that we can go into isolation and heal on our own, I don't think is a truism. Mm -hmm. I think, yes, we do need to establish a secure relationship with self, but many times there's aspects of healing that do require the receiving the love from others. And you talk about that in the book, because yeah. that is a question that people ask, either they, you know, they say that you have to be healthy before you can have a healthy relationship. And yeah, that's and not I necessarily true. Right. I would say healthy enough so that you're not harming yourself or your partner, or the relationship. Absolutely. But could this idea of being completely healed, I don't think that's how it works. Right. Normalizing that we can heal with the right relationship. Yes. Or relationships. <laughs> relationships. Exactly. Yeah. Our <laughs> relationships. I found it interesting mm -hmm. that a lot of people were hurt by somebody polyamorous who wasn't mm -hmm. doing it in the right way. So I, there's a classmate who was afraid to attend your lecture because she she had a wound of like dating somebody that was poly, but just completely mistreated them and how it was done. 100%. And, then, and then they were pleasantly surprised like me that it was actually quite healing. Yeah, and the last chapter of Polly Wise gets into that. So when you get there, I think you'll appreciate, I go through a developmental lens Mm -hmm. of how people are doing any monogamy or polyamory yeah. at different developmental stages of adulthood. And those different developmental stages express differently. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so many biological adults are still in an adolescent phase of development mm -hmm. and people practicing monogamy or polyamory just in relationships, yeah. right? They're usually causing damage and it can be this sort of like my way or the highway, or those are your feelings. It's your stuff to deal with. That's not my responsibility. Like, I don't want any restrictions on me kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. And I don't advocate for that. And a lot of people are really harmed by someone who's saying they're doing polyamory and it's not very ethical in how they're doing it actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really centered on themselves getting their own needs met often at the expense of others. That was traumatizing for them, which would then be projected on your work, unfortunately, right. which exactly is right. amazing. It's like, it's not that. Right. Yeah. No, I'm actually very protective of people who have gone through those experiences that there is a wounding that can happen in the name of non-monogamy that is very unfortunate. I think each relationship structure sort of has its shadow. Exactly. I'm excited to finish this book. <laughs> Great, yeah. and so I have a part that's terrified of being judged. Mm -hmm. Even me like doing this interview, I'm like, oh, people are going to think I, like, it's really fascinating. Have you experienced judgment or attack or unsafety because of the work that you do? Isn't it incredible to say mostly not? Oh my God. Yay. I'm yeah. so glad. I feel so fortunate. Mm -hmm. um, and then mainstream folks have often really embraced the work. Yay. I'm so happy to I hear really that. I really want to support the work. Yes. I, mean, I think in maybe hundreds and hundreds of emails that I've gotten that are a thank you, Yay. I've gotten two that were like, how could you? And that was huh. all they said. They didn't okay. even elaborate. You know? <laughs> You're like, tell um, me more, which part? <laughs> right, exactly. Um, whereas as, yeah, both professionally, publicly, you know, the, the work has really been embraced um which is is beautiful yeah i'm so happy to yeah, and i that. knew i was taking a big risk yes i knew i was taking a risk but it felt necessary and worth it thank you for that so i'm so glad to hear that do you think it's because 
you're in North America. Yeah, there's, of course, privileges I have as a white person, as a North American, yes. English speaking. I think in almost every other category, I'm marginalized. <laughs> I'm educated, though. So, you know, this work would not fly all over the world, obviously. But there's other places, too, where it's almost um, more embraced than even here within our whole country. That's so interesting. And there there are places where literally, like, we would be murdered for having this conversation. Exactly. Like that's what's weird about our world, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had um someone who did, we did a podcast together and she said that her friend was listening to the podcast while traveling internationally and she was able to access it in one Middle Eastern country and then she went to a different one and it was banned. Wow. And and so this podcaster was like, it was you. <laughs> it was it was our conversation wow. that was banned, not the other ones that was in the podcast that had nothing to do with non-monogamy. And I was like, wow, that says a lot. Right. It says a lot. What I love that you and David did in this book is you listed your bias and where you're coming yeah. from. I think everybody should do that. Yeah, I really credit my one of my editors for that who sort of wanted us to kind of have this statement of bias and it felt good to do. It felt important. Is there anything else that you'd like to share that we haven't talked about? No, probably tons. I think (laughs) (laughs) there's so much. Yeah, but I think just, you know, wanting people to accept any parts within themselves that have been polycurious or fully polyamorous and at the very least be accepting of those around you that this might be who they are, how they are, who they want to be. Yeah. 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 Like it's so, so important. Yeah. Exactly. Well, thank you, Jessica. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. I don't care what people say. I'm so in love and I think it's fair. If I can give to more than one soul. Why should you care if I dare? Why should you care? If I die